incredibly accessible handwriting are their poignant, indeed heroic descriptions of natural wonders never before seen by white men. Their hastily scribbled maps, their simple but accurate drawings of birds and fish and native peoples. Our lenses moved in and almost microscopically surveyed the landscape of their recorded experiences on paper, picking out single words and phrases, my friend, Hungary Creek, scenes of visionary enchantment, S-E-E-N-S, -E -E scenes misspelled. Oh, the joy when they reached the Pacific, troublesome more often than not, and as always, each day, we proceeded on. As filmmakers, though, we knew that precious journals and borrowed photographs or paintings would not give an accurate sense of the explorer's difficult and exhilarating push up the Missouri. What we needed to do was retrace the core of discovery steps to film live modern cinematography of what they saw when they saw it. So, for three years, we froze on riverbanks, slogged through mud, endured temperatures in the 90s and 100s, and physical demands we had not experienced in decades of making historical documentaries. We filmed at every time of day and night, in every season, and from every conceivable vantage, looking, straining, insisting on bringing back a reality as close to the expeditions as was humanly possible. To our great disappointment, much of what Lewis and Clark saw, we can no longer see, of course. Progress has eliminated or diminished or obscured many of the pristine views that had challenged the vocabularies of the awestruck explorers as they struggled to describe the sublime works of nature they stumbled across at every bend in the river. We were forced to shoot around a hydroelectric dam that blocked a clean view of the Great Falls of the Missouri. We found, to our dismay, that a carefully composed shot would sometimes contain a power line or a fence line or the ruins of a ladder homesteader's attempt at manifest destiny or a highway. Often our only company out on the dusty dirt tracks of the prairie were the ominous black vehicles of the military men who serviced the hundreds of nuclear missile sites that now dot the land Lewis and Clark had first claimed for the United States. Where the core of discovery had observed huge herds of buffalo stretching to the horizon in the hundreds of thousands, we saw only a few head of cattle tagged and lowing comfortably in their fenced-in fields. But somehow, as we worked beside the Missouri and later its sister, the Columbia, that grandfather spirit pulled us along and gave us images of great beauty and experiences and emotions we will never forget. We saw a mountain goat and her kid hiking up the steep sides of the gates of the mountains in Montana as a dark rain and mist swirled above and below them. We braved a squall in an enclosed crab boat in the mouth of the Columbia and wondered how the narrow, open canoes of the expedition ever made it down and across that treacherous river. We saw a magnificent rainbow at the Great Falls just as Meriwether Lewis had, and we all stopped and thought about his and our inability to describe it. We greeted a hundred dawns and witnessed just as many sunsets, big, wide, dramatic affairs that went on in summer months until way past 10 in the evening. We watched lightning from 50 miles away and cowered rain soap near the white cliffs as it exploded just overhead. We saw lots of bald eagles. We argued land use and Western politics and big government with a river guide who was just as much of a Jeffersonian as we thought we were.